been here before. Uh, good evening. This is the April 18th regular board meeting of the um, Palo Alto Unified School District School Board. The board did not meet in closed session. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take just a minute to acknowledge that um, this is a really exciting time of year. There's a lot going on, especially at, our, at the high school level. Um, but you know, spring fever and starting end of the year activities, um, and it's an exciting time of year, but can also be really stressful. And I just want to acknowledge that our students and our staff and our community, um, in the past week, there have been several things that may have added a lot of undue stress. Um, a Stanford student lost his life this week, and I know that that has been the talk of a lot of um, a lot of students and staff and community, um, and that can be really upsetting, especially for those of us that have been around a long time and and you know carry a lot of a lot of emotion around that. Um, and additionally, again, a black teenager was shot knocking on a door, um, and um, it is a repeated reminder for our black students that many in society are just scared of them. Um, and I, I can't imagine the stress that adds. I think of my own student, my own children, and the stress they have from um, school and from sports and from college apps and everything else, and how stressful that is. But if you're a black student in America, you probably have this extra layer sitting on top of it um, that you could be shot or someone could be really scared of you. And I just want to acknowledge that for, for especially that portion of our community, it can be a really challenging time. So. Um, I have some things about public comment, but I will give them when we start open forum. Uh, so can I get an approval of the agenda order? So moved. Yeah. Turn it so moved. Second. Okay, student preferential board vote? Aye. Aye. Colleagues, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, okay, student board member reports. Who's gonna go first? Hi everyone, I'm Daniel and I'm here again to talk about gun activities. Gun held its dodgeball tournament last Wednesday and we had a lot of good attendance um, for the event. Close to 200 people signed up and a lot of gun students attended to watch. Gun student council members also went to the Castle Conference, which is a conference where all student council members from all over the nation were invited to join. The program was over the course of two days and had a lot of fun meeting other student leaders and um, teachers. Gun also held its data night last week. Site council representatives, teachers, and staff met to discuss the different statistics of the school. And overall, it was very informative, and there was also free Chipotle for anyone <laughs> that went. Additionally, again, there are very good news for CASP testing. Um, today, this morning, I met with Principal Stren, and Gun staff is predicting that this weekend, Gun will approach around 97 to 98% participation rate which is historic for gun, and it's very, very, like, very, very outstanding work. Um, so I'm here to thank all the students, um, including Maya Prakash and Nathan Levy, who are the, C uh, the junior vice and president. Um, they were doing a lot of publication and a lot of incentives like donuts and pizzas <laughs> for all the students that would take the tests. Um, there was also a lot of staff teachers and also parent work to convince their students to take the tests. So thank you to them too. A lot of school events are also coming up. Guns Culture Week is, Global Culture Week is next week where, we, where we'll be having many activities during lunch like food tasting, performances, and other dances. Prom for juniors and seniors will be this Saturday at the Exploratorium, which is very exciting. Grad speech tryouts for seniors will also be next week and they'll be evaluated by English teachers, Mr. Dunlap and Ms. Hall. Of course, it is also AP season, so many students are preparing for their tests, with most of the finals being held uh, this week and next week. For sports, Gunn has also had many important events, including the swim team senior night, baseball and softball games, including um, other sports such as lacrosse, volleyball, and badminton. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, hello, everyone. So yeah, as uh, Ms. Brianza said, we're returning back from spring break. And um, it just marks our like final stretch of the school year. And thankfully, we did have some of the spring weather to go along with it, which is really great. 
So over our spring break, Pally was just as active with our amazing theater program going to the State Thespian Festival from March 31st to April 2nd. Pally Theater swept the competition, placing first in musical theater, group acting, lighting design, makeup design, and prop design, and placing second in costume design, sound design, scene design, stage management, and duet acting. So Pally is very unique in its excellence in both acting and stage tech, and they earned several more awards beyond what I just mentioned. So I want to congratulate all the amazing, talented actors and techs for all their efforts. Um, our track and field team also brought amazing success during the break at the Arcadia Invitational. The boys' four by one mile relay finished ninth place, and girls placed third in the state in the four by um, 800 meter and second in distance medley relay, and they both broke our school record, so that's really impressive. Um, going to our school events, ASB is hosting our Spring Spirit uh, this week with dress up themes and rallies. So for dress up, our theme yesterday was country and country. So like country club and like country ranch. And today it was anything but a backpack. Uh, so notably students brought guitar cases, laundry hampers, pet carriers. I think there was a 3D printer, a shopping cart and an entire like grill to carry all their school supplies in. Um, tomorrow's gonna be pop and rock, then athletes and mathletes. And we'll be ending off with our Pally Spirit theme. Uh, for each day of the dress up, ASB uh, hosted a best dress competition during brunch where students can walk down like, or walk on like a, this cool catwalk stage and win prizes for their outfits. Today was also our first spring spirit rally, which was a student versus staff volleyball game where students, six through each grade, from my opinion, slayed the competition since they won 31 to 26. Um, and we will have our second rally on Thursday at the football field. Uh, which is a relay race involving cup stacking, water balloons, and like the little sitting scooters um, around the track. Spring Spirit Week is also collaborating with Coachella this week, which is a pally version of Coachella, um, where on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during lunch, students will be able to take photos with friends, get temporary glitter tattoos, and eat churros while watching student bands and performers. ASB also hosted our international night last Friday with students representing their cultures and countries. Community members had the chance to go to different student booths, try out cultural foods, give a go at hitting a pinata, and also hear the Sanford Taiko group perform. In addition to hosting appointed interviews in the coming weeks, ASB is also planning for prom with our prom asking competition. So far, I've already seen a flash mob on the quad and someone serenaded um, the other person with You Belong With Me, which I thought was really sweet. Um, for class events, freshmen held their ice cream social during lunch last Thursday with many different flavors and lots and lots of toppings. Uh, seniors, on the other hand, started our game of elimination last week. In elimination, each senior gets a target that they need to tag with their beach ball. And to stay safe, we need to hold the beach ball in one hand. And tomorrow, we'll have to hold it in our right hand to stay safe. You need to wish me luck because I have econ and that's unsafe, so I had to write like this. Um, and the winners will be the last student standing and the student with the most kills. In our arts department, Pally's Hay Fever showed last weekend with Friday, Saturday being sold out. Um, Hay Fever was a completely student run and produced show which took place in our black box or like our theater classroom. And I had the pleasure to watch it on Saturday. It was absolutely hilarious. Uh, I wish you could have seen it. Uh, Pally Dance will be hosting their spring show this Sunday, April 23rd at the PAC with students from the dance team, Dance 1 and 2, K-pop Dance Club, and Intramural Dance Club performing, so be sure to get your tickets. And our band and orchestra will be leaving for the New York trip tomorrow, so I'm sending my best wishes to all of our musical students. Um, going into clubs, the Princess Project held their prom dress drive last week, and the Communicate Club hosted guest speaker Deborah Liu, the CEO of Antistry and the founder of Facebook Marketplace at the MAC. Rise Club is working on Denim Day, in which students wear denim to show solidarity for survivors of sexual assault, which will be on Wednesday, April 26. Students have the chance to give back to their community both on and on campus today and tomorrow with Pally Service Day, which is a collaboration between Key Club and YCS. And ASB is also continuing our spring club visits through April. Finally, for other student events, sophomores and seniors took the cast testing last week during Primes, and Viking, Anthro, and Verde released their new issues to students. Science Olympiad State Finals would be next weekend, and 11 students from our speech and debate team actually went to the Tournament of Champions in Kentucky last weekend, and I believe they're coming back today. Uh, speech and debate will also be hosting their end of the year banquet next Monday, April 24th in the MAC. Uh, Mueka Chairwoman Charlene Nima came to speak to SJP students last Friday, and SJP hosted a postcard writing event with student de designed postcards in the MAC where students could advocate for federal recognition of the Mueka Ohlone tribe. Um, coming next, Coming up next week, I wanted to lastly invite the community to attend the reveal for the Same Moon, Same Stars mural, which will be next Monday on the 24th at 5.30.
at the Pali 800's building. And it will feature Cherokee Nation's first U.S. Delegate Kimberly Teehee advocating to get her to the seat of, to get a seat in the House of Representatives. Um, thank you so much. That's all from me. Thank you. And as board president, I'm just going to let you know this is not a safe space for elimination. So you better hold on to that ball tonight. <laughs> um, Superintendent's report. Uh, brief tonight. Just one quick comment. Uh, I understand there's been a fair amount of chatter around the multivariable calculus in our connection with Foot, Foothill and De Anza Colleges. Uh, families who want to discuss options for courses, or more importantly, students who want to discuss options for courses, should start with their site counselors. And in this district, unlike some, uh, we're lucky to have large counseling support systems at both schools, although it looks different. Uh, uh, both have plenty of people to help. If questions remain, I know there's been confusion about who the point person might be. Dr. Che, uh, Jung Che, uh, is the appropriate person to ask about dual enrollment ap approved courses. Uh, we've sent multiple communications to families about the requirements for credentialing, uh, done our best to explain uh, why this is a credentialing issue and why some classes qualify and others don't. In some cases, it'll be the same title will qualify at one school and won't at another based on the credentials of the teacher at that site. That's already true, by the way. Um, we've been told that the class in question will be available online and that community colleges will not charge high school students for the course. We have had requests for us to uh, ask Foothill to do additional communication. And you know, honestly, uh, we, can, we can talk to them about the potential benefits, but at the end of the day, it's their course, and it's their college, and it's their communications department, and they will, they will handle that the way that they they choose to, uh, they are aware of the situation. And again, while it's being currently framed as an issue in math, this is an issue that's across our district and has been uh, for some period of time. So uh, Dr. Che, who's also with us in the audience tonight, will do part of our presentation and will uh, also, in a little bit later in the uh, agenda, um, consider her approval as an assistant superintendent in innovation where one of her main duties will be dual enrollment and college outreach, which was already uh, in the mix months ago, um, is, the, uh, is the appropriate person to answer further questions. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to open forum. Right now it looks like we have... We've got about 20, which means one minute each. Um, a couple of reminders. Um, if you plan to speak, be sure to get your name in um, by the end of the first speaker. The first speaker tonight is going to be Eileen Kim over Zoom. Not yet, though, Eileen. Um, after Eileen Kim is done speaking, we're going to close the list um, so we have a sense of how many students we have, uh, how many speakers we have. Um, two students will speak first, as always. I will do my best to call on anyone that said yes as are you a student or that I know to be a student. And then we'll just go in order. I know that um, when we passed our updated policy, we said we would try to go Zoom in person, Zoom in person. And I will make that attempt, but I did find last time I called on Zoom in person alternating, but sometimes the person was actually in the room or it just didn't really work. So I'm not gonna put a lot of energy towards that one tonight. Um, <laughs> it, it, it seems silly. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think I think that's it. So just a reminder to make sure you get your um, card in by the end of Eileen's um, one minute. Uh, so our first speakers are, oh wait, Eileen, I said Eileen Kim was our first speaker, but she's not a student. I'm going to students first, I'm sorry. Um, first we have Kashi Tutea, then we have um, Alexki um, Velov, and then we have Vince Wu. And I think Kashi's in person. Come on up to the microphone. And when you start talking, we will start the timer. Okay, yes. Is hey. this on? Yep. Great. I'm Kashi Tuteja, a student at Palo Alto High School. 
Multivariable calculus and linear algebra are critical STEM classes essential for tackling complex modern challenges. Whether it is physicists experimenting with next generation batteries, meteorologists uh, forecasting climate change effects, or economists developing policies to address wealth inequality, each profession depends on a deep foundation of mathematics. I personally know dozens of students at Pali, including myself, who are interested in pursuing research and even careers in these disciplines. In fact, the recent math survey tells us 43% of Pali and Gun students are interested in taking these classes. Losing the opportunity to take them on campus with our classmates and friends will put us at a disadvantage. The additional cost and effort to take these courses outside of school reduces equity of access. Our neighboring school districts still offer these classes. Are we to accept that we will be behind our neighboring districts? Will Palo Alto no longer be a leader in math education? Please find a way to offer multivariable and linear algebra here for Pali and Gun students. Thank you. That's a debater right there. I said, that's a debater right there. He like, it was perfect in his timing. Um, thank you, Kashi. Uh, so next is um, Ales Alexi, and then um, Vince Wu, and then Brian Liu. Hello. On behalf of the students of the Paul Walter Unified School District, I would like to present a letter to the district signed by over 50 concerned students pertaining to the removal of dual enrollment, multivariable calculus, and linear algebra as course offerings. This decision has affected each and every single one of us on an individual level, severely limiting our options for continued math learning in our junior and senior years. As constituents of this district, we urge you to strongly, to strongly consider the changes proposed in this letter. Thank you. Thank you. And you can either give me that letter or you can, you can email it to us at board at PAUSD.org. Okay, I'll take it, great. Thank you. Thanks, I can pass them out. Thank you. Um, next is Vince, and then Brian, Lou, and then Miles Hua. All right. Hi, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome, all right. So continuing on the topic of multivariable calculus and linear algebra, we would like to reiterate a fact, which even Dr. Austin has mentioned when speaking about this topic which is that this class has been offered in person and on campus in the past. Nearly a decade ago, the course was taught by Pali teachers who are also affiliated with Kenyatta College. And in recent memory, it's been taught by an instructor commuting from Foothill. This also matches MVLA's approach to offering the courses. To conclude an on-campus course should main a potential solution to this issue moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you for crossing people out as we go, whoever's doing that, Vicki. <laughs> um, so next is Brian over Zoom, and then after that would be Miles, and then Benjamin Vakil. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, having lived through the COVID-19 pandemic, most of us have experienced firsthand the difficulties of virtual schooling. In many cases, the virtual learning environment severely limits the capabilities of the instructor to ensure that the students are gaining an in-depth understanding of the course material, and by proxy, inhibits the learning of the students enrolled in the course. One of the most significant barriers to the accessibility of the multivariable calculus and linear algebra courses would be commuting to the Foothills or De Anza campus in order to take the courses. An on-campus offering il entirely eliminates this barrier, which discourages interested students from enrolling in the course. Moreover, an on-campus class encourages collaboration between peers and ensures that the instructor is able to more effectively convey information and receive immediate feedback on their teaching. Please consider on-campus courses as an option moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Miles, I think, is in person, and then Benjamin Vakil is in person, and then we just had Brian Liu. Let me see if there's any other students. No. Then we'll go on to Eileen Kim. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Uh, just stand close to the mic. Okay. The reasons which Dr. Austin has cited when explaining the cancellation of the classes include off-campus courses causing GPA inflation and an in inability to secure an instructor with credentials to teach the class. This claim that this course is used to artificially inflate GPA can be entirely disqualified on account of the course rigor. Furthermore, representatives of Foothills College have confirmed that the cancellation of the course was entirely one-sided on the behalf of PAUSD and came as a surprise to Foothills College. This puts into question Dr. Austin's inability to find a credentialed instructor as it seems like he has entirely disqualified the possibility of said instructor to be provided by Foothills. Additionally, Dr. Austin has highlighted the fact that teachers who have previously taught the class have passed away. 
However, the class has only been offered through Foothills College of recent memory. We urge the board to address the confusing and conflicting communications surrounding the cancellation of the course offerings. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin? And then up to Eileen Kim and Edith Cohen. Okay, I'm Benjamin Vakil, a junior at Gunn High School. I fully agree with my peers who have spoken tonight. The discontinuation of multivariable calculus and linear algebra is a travesty, but I'm not here to repeat their fantastic remarks. I am here instead to call, on the gen call out the general lack of interest in advocating for students' best interests. I call for the establishment of a body to advise on PAUSD math policy that puts students first. You would be hard pressed to find a meaningful number of students at our schools who feel connected to the decisions made here on Churchill Avenue. I call for this body to be made up of teachers and experts, but also students in equal proportion as equal members. I call for this body to not be deficient at its mandate, nor pompous in its habits, not convened for the purpose of political posturing, but for the benefit of the students, where we are not sidelined to one minute speeches gesticulated into a void. Bombastic attitudes and cherry-picked data points have no place in the school environment, yet they seem to dominate this discussion. This needs to change. Don't be children. Communicate with us. Thank you. Thank you. Eileen Kim, then Edith Cohen, and then Avery Wong. Here is a question. Exactly whom does our school board trustees and the superintendent Don Austin serve? Were they elected and hired respectively to serve the interests of the employees of the city of Palo Alto, as well as solely represent the interests of PAUSD employees? Or were the board and trustee members elected and Don Austin hired to serve first and foremost the students who attend Palo Alto schools? Does the board and superintendent have a fiduciary duty towards the parents of the children attending Palo Alto schools? And what about the taxpayers funding PAUSD with parcel tax and passing measure O? Does the board and superintendent have a fiduciary duty towards the taxpayers? Because it seems to me by hastily deciding to enroll the city of Palo Alto employees into our schools this fall, it's not only short-sighted, but a deep betrayal of the fiduciary duty entrusted to our board members and superintendent by the very people who put them in power instead of being fiscally responsible and honoring their duty towards the students, the parents and the taxpayers seems their focus is on the city of Palo Alto employees and employees. Uh, thank you. Just a reminder to the public that if there's an item agendized, you need to sign up to speak to it at that agenda item. And open forum is to talk about things that are not agendized tonight. That topic is going to come up in a little bit. Edith Cohen, who I said on Zoom, but I think I see her in person. And then we have Avery Wong and then Devin Ardeshna, who, oh, who is an alum. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So it's heartbreaking that students feel obstructed by their school. They are not learning at school, but told that outside math is, teach is cheating. They are told they should go to a private school, evaporate. Their very existence is an inconvenience. They are told, incorrectly so, that pursuing their passions, but that by pursuing their passions, they harm others. They are told they failed when they are objectively ready. How can this be right? Don't, let our, don't uh, all our students deserve encouragement? Even if their passion is STEM and math, shouldn't our school strive to be a highway of learning rather than a roadblock? I'm a computer scientist. I use advanced math to invent algorithms. I love my work. But many decades ago, I was born to refugees that arrived with nothing to a poor country. Early access to university level math was the key to becoming who I am, a key to my own happiness and to making contributions. Please keep access open for our students. Please let them shine, encourage them, respect them, Thank even you. if you don't relate. You can Thanks. send the rest of your comments to board at PAUSD.org. Thank you. Um, Avery Wong, who I think is on Zoom, then Devin Ardeshna. Oh, Avery's here. Change my mind. See, this is why I don't alternate, because you never know. OK. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm the inventor of Shazam, name that tune, uh, the app with hundreds of millions of users. I use multivariable calculus oh, and linear algebra to invent Shazam. Uh, I had the privilege of taking MVC, linear algebra, and differential equations while I was in high school. It helped me hit the ground running when I got to college so I could jump directly into more advanced classes. And I want to say that I'm also a product of public school, and I'm grateful for the education and excellent teachers I had. Please don't cancel multivariable calculus. Thank you. Uh, Devin Ardeshna, and then Satomi Akazaki, and Allison Rosen.
Devin, are you there on Zoom? Hi. Oh, great. Um, please listen to all the students that have spoken today about calculus. They are pleading with you not to cancel these math courses. Some of them really just love math. And for others, it's a gateway to a different STEM interest. Um, you know, several people have proposed ideas to address this credentialing issue, but haven't gotten any traction with staff. And as others have pointed out, the explanations given by Dr. Austin are not really consistent with the history of these course offerings. So you began to wonder, is there really even a credentialing issue? Or is somebody trying to get rid of these courses? I just have two asks of PAUSD. First, be upfront and honest with your students. They deserve that much. And uh, second, engage with the community. And together, we can find a solution to reinstate on-campus multivariable calculus and linear algebra. You know, everyone that's here just wants to help resolve this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Satomi, and then Allison Rosen, and Brian Conrad. Thank you to the board. We request that PASD reverse its decision and offer multivariable calculus and linear algebra at Pally and Gunn for the new school year. We would like our students, at least 80 are affected, to have in-person class experience at our schools. The students were abruptly told that they would need to register at Foothill directly to take the class and were given very limited guidance on how to proceed. We're also concerned because high school students have the lowest priority for registering for classes at Foothill. Many may not be able to take the class. The superintendent has said that it is a credentialing issue. If this is the case, then PAUSD made a mistake. We urge the district to fix its mistake and help these students. California Education Code allows college, student in college instructors to serve students participating in these dual enrollment programs without requiring an appropriate credential. While it is possible that a high school teacher may need special credentials in order to teach a dual enrollment class, it appears that a community college teacher does not. Professor Douglas Leblin from Front of the College has been teaching, at this, at teaching the class at Mountain View Los Altos High. We should reach out to them to request such an instructor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Allison Rosen, Brian Conrad, Stephen Davis. I too, can, you can hear me? Ah, uh, yes. I too uh, agree with all these speakers, especially Doug Leblin. He's um, someone who comes to several high schools. What I would say is that if there's an item on the agenda where we exceed 30 people who want to speak and they're unable to deliver their meticulously crafted one minute comment, that's a sign that the topic's important to the community. And where is it polite to let us know that we can email our comments? We really need an additional meeting to find a solution. You have the most brilliant minds in the world in this community. And Dr. Cho, is wonderful. It would be great if you direct her to organize a meeting where we can all find a solution together. The um, people who want to take the fourth year of math are STEM students. They really need multivariable calculus. They, ex they expect to take four years of math in order to get into engineering programs. Why not find solutions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian Conrad, Stephen Davis, Ronith Raha. Oh, and you're a student. Did I skip you, Ronith? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll come up to you soon. Brian, Stephen, Ronith. OK. Uh, my name is Brian Conrad. So I'm the son of a public school teacher, professor of mathematics at Stanford, and the director of undergraduate studies in math at Stanford. I've been deeply involved in developing curricula that lead to skills desired by employers and the explosive growth of Stanford's course on multi <coughs> multivariable calculus and linear algebra. Those fields of math are the intellectual foundation for all modern work in artificial intelligence, data science, finance, inventory optimization for supply chains, and machine learning. Google search and modern speed ups in medical imaging both rest on linear algebra in million dimensional spaces. Many marvels such as ChatGPT, Google Translate, Pixar Animation, and recommender systems from Amazon to Netflix rely on creative use of the same math. This math is an essential early component of UC degrees and fields for the most sought after jobs. This school district doesn't hesitate to provide resources in varsity sports for athletically ambitious students to achieve their full potential, so it must be similarly committed to helping intellectually ambitious students achieve their full potential. I look forward to hearing in the near future about the status of your search for an instructor to teach this math on campus to the many students who crave that knowledge as in prior years. Stephen Davis, Rooney Thra, sorry, um, and Richard Offrey. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Austin's staff for uh, making a presentation on special education to a community group last night. 
uh, unfortunately, only uh, 18 parents got to hear that. Uh, it's strange. I get emails from the, my kids' teachers. I get weekly emails from Dr. Austin. But somehow, the school district can't manage to send an email to the 2,000-ish parents of the special education community while they can manage to send a, uh, someone to have a status report to 18 parents for the last several months. Uh, we deserve to be heard, and we deserve to be communicated with. Thank you. Uh, Ramiz, Richard, and uh, Robbie. Hi, uh, I'm Ronit Raha, a student at Palo Alto High School. As a result of the recent decisions made by PAUSD staff, those students who will complete the AP calculus requirements before their senior year have been left with few options to continue their education in math within PAUSD. Not only does this create barriers for students who wish to continue pursuing their interest in math, it is outright detrimental to the future of math enrichment in this district, creating a situation where PAUSD falls behind in math enrichment compared to neighboring districts. Board members and staff, we still have an opportunity to prevent this from taking place. We urge you to re-examine the new policies and to reinstate multivariable calculus and linear algebra as offered courses. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Richard and Arabi, both over Zoom, I think. Richard there. Yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes. So you, the school board, has the responsibility to provide oversight of what is going on in the district. However, you sit in silence while Don makes excuses about canceling popular dual enrollment classes by talking about retired and deceased teachers instead of finding solutions. It is one thing to cancel a dual enrollment class because the curriculum is outdated or there's limited student interest. It is entirely different to randomly cancel a long-standing class that 43% of the student population expressed direct interest in taking, with many already enrolled for the next year, and further completely blindsiding the community college that has taught it for years. Our students should not be forced to give up their enriching after-school activities in order to take multivariable calculus outside of school. Thank you. Thank you. Arabi? On Zoom, I believe. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm here to sincerely request Dr. Zhang and whoever is concerned with dual enrollment to reinstate multivariable calculus in school during school hours. The option suggested by PAUSD of registering into community colleges on our own is not a guaranteed solution because, number one, the number of sections of MBC in community colleges are very few and offered during school hours. And number two, registration for high school students is number eight in line. Hence, most probably these students will not get a class. Please collaborate with Foothill or De Anza or Kenyatta College and work around the credential issues or any other issues and please make a plan for our students to take MVC at our high schools. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's all of the comments for Open Forum. Um, and Dr. Austin, I, can I just clarify quickly because I heard a couple of different things in here. What? Oh, oh there's another. There's, a, oh, there's more comments. But Satomi, Satomi, did you sign up twice? Okay, I thought we were done. Then I see that Nicole Chuang, are you you're signed up as well? And I see the timestamp there. Okay. Great. Good evening. With all the discussions about math offerings over the last few meetings and tonight, the tenor of these board meetings can feel tense and negative. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank the students that have come forward to share their experiences and opinions and encourage more students to speak out. While I applaud the students finding ways to make their voices heard, like our two amazing student board reps, Johanna and Daniel, and student writer Lucas, who wrote an opinion piece in the Campanile last month about the effects of increasing academic pressure on mental health, as well as all the students who spoke tonight and over the last few board meetings, we the adults need to do better at engaging those students that don't feel comfortable speaking up in such a public way. 
I know there was a survey at Pali, and that's a start, but we need to do more to hear our students. We need to listen to all our students and involve them in these discussions because they are the ones that will be directly affected by these decisions by the board. Thank you. Thank you. So just real quickly, we, we did teach this class on campus when Mr. Toma worked at Pali. I don't know if we taught it at Gunn as well. I'm going to be a little slow to answer some of these questions on the spot because some of these I, I don't want to misspeak and yeah. I don't know that history. Then, then you don't, I, I just want to make, and, and then since Mr. Toma graduated, since Mr. Toma retired, at least at Pali, it's been over Zoom. It has not been during the school day and it recently is, it, has been it has after been school Zoom. over Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Just I, two other just quick points. I don't want to get into it because it's not agendized, but uh, for the, the students who, who spoke, thank you for coming. I, I, I do want to clarify a couple things though. Nobody's against the course. Everybody hears the value. We hear the students. We wouldn't have done a survey and asked the question if we didn't care what the answers were. The problem in this case is truly credentialing right now. And what was read has been read before in partially, in, in, in just a partially correct piece, the CTC and the CDE have conflicting statements on dual enrollment. Dual enrollment across the state of California is the Wild West. It is so bad that I'm a member of the high school superintendents coalition, which is a purely a lobbyist group. Our number one priority for the state of California is around the work in dual enrollment partly to look at these places where the rules conflict and to make them cleaner. I'll tell you this, additionally, while we are fixed on this particular course, and I understand the reasons why it, it resonates here in this community, there are districts all over the state that have zero connections with their community colleges. And a community college holds a ton of power through their academic senate and we're lucky to have a great relationship with Foothill. As far as during the school day, that can only be done through dual enrollment. Dual enrollment has rules that we will follow. If a teacher becomes available or a teacher on site becomes um, credentialed and, and, and works through with the Foothill process, we'd offer this course tomorrow. And that is still on the table. But right now in this moment, this is what it is. And the message is, I, I, I'm not sure what is still confusing about this. This is the issue. It is a CDE issue. We have sent that out to every person that has asked. The CDE is confirmed. There is no gray in this particular area, but this should not be confused with a lack of um, understanding of the importance of the course or um, a desire to in any way impede students from taking these courses. And that's, that's probably as far as I can go today, having it non-agendized. Yeah, I appreciate that. You probably went farther than we should have, but I appreciate that because to, I want to thank all the students especially for coming to, coming to talk or calling in over Zoom. It's always really good to hear from you. Um, and I, I think that you have heard from staff that um, this is something we are really interested in being able to offer if the, if, if the stars align and all the opportunities present themselves. So right now that is not the case, but if it becomes the case, for sure, we'll offer I, it. I did get an answer to your question, though. Oh. It was offered at one course, I believe Pally, and if you were a student at Gunn that wished to take the course, when it was offered at Pally, you had to travel to Pally. So that's, that's the history, the best I have it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, moving along to the um, consent calendar. Um, this is a group of items that we approve all in one vote, unless a community member or a board member wants to pull it for further discussion. Do I have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Um, okay, uh, student board members. Aye. Aye. Colleagues? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Consent calendar is approved. We are moving on to our first action item, which is our budget assumptions. And it looks like we have no comments on it. I know we take staff first, but no one has to remind me about comments right now. <laughs> but we'll keep an eye out to see if anyone jumps in. <laughs> so budget assumptions. 
two things. I'm going to totally cheat here real quick before okay. I pass it over to Ms. Chow. Okay. And just say, um, while well, I loved hearing the percentage of students who tested it at Gunn, um, you're all going to fall out of your seats. Pally's testing percentage this year was 90%. Maybe the biggest, well, it will be the biggest turnaround in the entire state of California. I got to hand it to you. I don't. 100%. <laughs> so good I'm, job to know, both schools. Look, color me shocked, but okay, great. Hooray for us. Okay, Ms. Chow, budget assumptions. Thank you, Dr. Austin, and good evening, board. This uh, item on the budget assumptions certainly is not the uh, first time we have seen this. We've seen it several times this spring as we prepared our budget development for the coming year. And tonight it is uh, before the board for approval. Before it moves to approval, I just wanted to point out there was one small change uh, since we last saw this at the last board meeting. And I wanna call that out for you. Uh, it, it is on this slide right here. The, the last item that is bolded, the district office administrator, this is a budget offset as this position, uh, the individual is retiring and it will not be filled for next year. So I did want uh, the board to be aware of that is the one change since we discussed this at the last board meeting. Um, and with that, that concludes the only change that we have in our budget assumptions for this evening. Okay, colleagues, questions, comments? I move that we, oh. I move that we approve the budget assumptions. Is there a second? I second. Okay, we've got a, a motion and a second on the table. Does anybody have any comments or questions? We have, we have looked at this a lot. I think we've seen it five times. <laughs> Ready. Uh, student board reps, preferential vote? Aye. Aye. Uh, colleagues, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you, Ms. Chow. Thank you, Cabinet, for all of your work. Um, 5B, proposed options to address declining enrollment. So this is um, a second time back, and um, at, the, at the last meeting, we discussed several aspects of the ad hoc committee's work, and we brought back three uh, that seemed to have resonated. We we did group them together, and we'll ask that uh, you consider them as a group, but you can certainly amend as you would like. Uh, you can vote on one, two, or all three of them. Uh, make amendments to none, to all three. So it's, it's going to be up to you. Um, I think in this case, since we've already talked about it, it'd be better off if we take comments, and then we can take questions that you may have. There might be some very specific questions. Okay, uh, board colleagues, questions, comments? Oh, are there speakers first? There are speakers, and you just said it. You did, you did. You just surprised me. Oh, that's it. Um, Stephen Davis and Terry Baldwin. Uh, I was puzzled to look at, see the emphasis in uh, addressing declining enrollment uh, on uh, Palo Alto employees and staff, not because those aren't legitimate approaches, but uh, why aren't we talking to the, what is it, 2,000 families or students who left? Um, is the, uh, was this a notch in our en enrollment due to um, uh, COVID and people seeing inside the sausage factory? Uh, and therefore, uh, enrollment's going to slowly recover as our younger kids come back in or new people enroll. Uh, or uh, are families no longer able to afford to live in Palo Alto and we're in a structural um, downturn? Um, but the first people we should talk to are those who left, and a lot of people left. Uh, if nothing else, um, they probably have kids of the right age who we should want here. We should be able to compete with any uh, private school in uh, the area, I would think. Um, people pay a premium to live in Palo Alto for the public schools, so the fact that people are willing to spend thirty to $50,000 or more, I don't know, to go to private school says there's a problem, and we should find out what that answer is. Uh, I found... Uh, 
worrying about tactics and counts of people uh, rather premature and unnecessary when we don't even know how many people from those two populations would, uh, would they address our uh, student body shortfall? Or finally, do we need to consider whether we need to build down the school district because we don't have enough students going forward? Uh, there seemed to be a lot more work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Baldwin. Hello, Terry Baldwin, president of the Palo Alto Educators Association. Um, I didn't realize at the last meeting that this also was about um, staff and the percentage um, that they work to have their students come. So um, I would like us to look at a lower percentage. Um, I'd love 50%, um, but I know 60 probably works better, um, definitely better than 75 because most teachers, I don't know about classified, but most teachers do not work 75. They work 60 or 80. So if it's 75, it's still 80 for most of our employees. Um, so I'd like you to consider at least going down to 60%. And um, all of our other benefits are 50% or more. And I know other districts do a lower percentage. So I hope you would consider that. Thank you. Thank you. OK. That's all the comments. OK. <laughs> uh, colleagues, uh, Ms. Siegel. I have quite a few questions. I hope that's okay. Sure. Um, kind of starting at the beginning. Okay, we are a basic aid district, meaning we do not get funded per student. Thus, increasing students will result in a decrease of funding per student. So can you help me in the community better understand the rationale for increasing enrollment instead of choosing to have more money per student? That is my first question. You want to hear it? I'll be happy to take these questions as oh. they come. Um, first, there, there are critical points as far as enrollment that allows us to do certain things. Um, we, we looked at our enrollment for next year, and, and at a glance, uh, we had in our, when you take Ohlone and Escondido out of the mix, uh, because our choice programs with dual enrollment, or uh, uh, dual immersion, sorry, it's so in my head right now. Um, we had 10 combination classes on the board, and this is two weeks ago. One thing we'd like to do is to be able to reduce that number of combination classes. So you could say, well, we're a basic aid district, just add 10 teachers. It's, that'd be about a million and a half dollars. And we could. Well, we could do that. Uh, we also would not have had the 7% compensation increase to all employees to keep pace with surrounding districts. So there are trade-offs. So we're not saying that uh, we're doing combination classes as a trade-off for salary increases, but what we are saying is an increase in the number of students could reduce the number of combination classes, which I think we had agreement is a better situation when we can do it. Number two, we wanted to reduce the immediate need to uh, really dive into closing schools. If this was not a basic aid district, we'd be closing a minimum of two right now. Uh, we are headed very squarely in the direction of two strand schools at most sites, uh, three, three strands at a couple. Um, most school districts, those are closures. Even at two, we're going to have one school that right now, as it sits, is a one to a one and a half strand school. So if we want to have the closing schools discussion, we, we could. Uh, but that was everybody's last option, including mine. Uh, that's something I really don't want to do. And then finally, the more students you have at a school, the more electives and extracurriculars you can have. A smaller school, especially at a secondary level, the smaller the school gets, and Pletcher's an example, when it starts to get smaller, you start losing sections of electives because there just aren't enough kids to go around and give you the breadth of programs that, that we enjoy here. So those are, those are three of the, the main reasons why increasing enrollment uh, seemed advantageous for us. And if I can just add on to that, um, yes, I saw that Meb just put in a card, and we're going to let Meb talk in, in just a minute. Um, if I can just add on to that, 
certainly, if we had to close schools, that's a very hard thing for a community, and that's something that we do. <laughs> you elected us to, to make the hard calls, and that's something that, that we know that sometimes we have to do. Um, I think that my big hesitation in doing that is knowing that the state has ordered us to add over 6,000 housing units in the next 10 years, and if we do that, which we've been directed to do, that will add a lot more students, and the, the um, disruption of shutting down two schools, maybe three schools, and redrawing boundaries for elementaries and shutting down a middle, whatever, and then knowing that in a handful of years, maybe five years, we're gonna be reopening them with more students, it feels like at this point, it makes more sense to sort of stay the course and, and watch that, house get, that housing get built and see where the populations are. Um, so if we, had, if we didn't have 6,000 units coming, then I, I think that we would all be saying, wow, this is really hard and disruptive, but we just need to close some schools. Um, Cupertino closed three last year. Some surrounding districts are closing schools. Um, and it is a reflection of um, declining birth rates and declining um, population in the Bay Area. It, we, our, our decline looks just like all the other districts in the area. So, um, and so we have a comment from Meb. From Meb, I'm going to wait and let Miss Siegel finish her comments. And can you um, be closer yeah, to the I'll mic? Speak so closer. I can answer. Okay. My second question is: Have we considered, as one of the ways to increase enrollment, have we considered the um, Tinsley program expanding the Tinsley program? Why or why not? Um, short answer: No. <laughs> and uh, slightly longer answer. I, I saw my predecessor had attempted that, and it's prohibited uh, by the court order itself. We have a cap on the number of students that we can take, and that is to protect the existing school district. Yeah, Ravenswood, Ravenswood doesn't want us to do that. Yeah. That will put them more at risk, but we can't do it anyway, so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> My next question is, as I'm trying to understand this, is there a, like a magic number or a set quota that we are trying to reach that once we reach we suddenly stop? Um, if so, the order that I see there, it goes one, two, and three. Is that the order that we're following until we cap? Is there a magic number or quota? Two answers. Uh, the, the listing of the three items is non-prioritized, and need, none of them play on the other, meaning that they're all separate. Uh, number two, there is no magic number, okay. and uh, part of what uh, we're proposing, we had very little detail in here because we're going to have to write the ARs on the back end. In fact, we have a, a meeting set with the city if this item is approved tonight for Thursday, uh, is that the board would, would have to vote on this to continue each year, meaning that if a student came into our district uh, through one of these uh, different means, these privileges, um, they would be in, they would be considered residents just like we do with Tinsley but that the board would have to take action each year to take the next group. Uh, and just one thing I just want to point out, because it takes too many words to write everything in here, okay? Um, Tinsley's very different. We get 60 kids every year, and when 60 leave us, we get another 60. With the city, we're expecting 25 to 50, somewhere in there, and when we get them, we get them. There's not going to be another year, another year, another It's going to trickle in and out. So I, we think that impact is going to be really minimal overall. Um, thank you. And then I just have one other question comment. Um, as declining enrollment is clearly an issue, I would like to address the fact that based on data, by the end of the 21-22 school year, 283 students left PAUSD for private school, which also private school does include residential treatment centers. Um, about 222 students left PAUSD because they moved out of California, and 201 students moved out of the country. So the highest number of departures was for private school. So one question I have is, are we doing any sort of exit surveys for families who leave for private school at this time? Um, two things. We could be more precise with that number if we need to later for the private school piece because what you stated is completely accurate that uh, residential treatment centers um, and some, sometimes students attend multiple times. Each one shows us an exit and it's marked as private. Um, so that number is a little misleading. And the other piece of that is uh, what's not cited 
there, and you may have this information, I forget, um, is the number of private school students who re-enter with us. It's, it is common here for students to leave for yeah. a period of time and return, so it's not like we're losing 200 a year and not regaining pretty close to that same number. Um, as far as exit surveys, no, we do not do exit surveys. I, w um, I would like the district to consider doing exit, exit surveys, perhaps as part of the man uh, mandatory annual data um, update that we get every year, that parents get every year. It could be just a cu couple of multiple choice questions just to get an idea as to why families are leaving for private school. Um, we can try to retain students. The loss of students to private school not only affects our enrollment, but it affects our PTA and our PI donations, which directly impact our students, teachers, and programs. And that the number I stated does not include families who don't start in PAUSD and TK or kindergarten, but choose to start private school at that point. And perhaps if we understand the reasons for leaving, we can hopefully reduce the families who choose private school or um, who choose private school for TK or kindergarten, as well as the families who are leaving. Because even if um, they do come back, it's still disruptive for enrollment. And so it would be great to try to retain our families. Those are my questions. Great, thanks. Um, Meb Steiner, would you like to go now? We're keeping things fancy, you know, we're keeping on your toes. Keep everyone on their toes. Thank you. Good evening, Meb Steiner, uh, president of CSEA. I just want to sort of support um, any lower FTE that the board decides to agree to. I had put it in my email um, to the board and also in discussions with Dr. Austin. 0.75 is a great start. It addresses the inequity I addressed at the last board meeting between elementary special ed aides and high school aides. But um, our benefits, most of them start at, at 0.5, at 50%. And so um, that's a natural number. But this is a decision that is within the discretion of the board and really what the board is comfortable with. And it's uh, a decision that the district can make. Um, Ms. Baldwin's points about how it impacts our teachers because their structure of FTE is a little bit different than classified. So I just want to um, say I'm in full support of as low a number as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Drop, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I appreciate the process um, and I want to appreciate the process here. The ad hoc process has been great in all our ad hoc committees, but you know, to have a committee meet five times and um, really get into these issues from an informed place and come to us with recommendations is very helpful for the board not to have to um, come up with things or dis, you know make decisions on the fly. Um, so that's really helpful. There are a lot of pragmatic reasons to, to do this that we've heard. Another pragmatic reason is that you know the city offers um, a number of services to our families that our families find um, very useful. Crossing guards, middle school athletics, those are things that the city does. And so in furtherance of that collaboration, it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing, it's a pragmatic thing for us to reciprocate in some way and to allow city employees to come into our district is, is a benefit that is reciprocal. And it's one that doesn't cost us much. And in fact, it benefits us in a number of ways. Um, in addition to all the pragmatic reasons, it's just it, it's just a good thing to do. I mean, it's the right thing to do, right? And that, I mean, that sort of is all things being equal, the reason to do something. Um, these are members of our community, and all the reasons that we've already discussed about why um, folks, um, why we want teacher housing, why we want folks who go to our schools, um, who live in our community, to be a part of uh, you know the oneness and the the collaborative feeling that we think benefits all of our students. Those reasons all go to having city employees um, send their kids to our schools. So, um, you know, on balance, it's just a good thing to do. So, all the pragmatic reasons aside, which are, of course, the driving reasons when we have a fiduciary duty to the district, um, but all things being equal, you know, it's 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 fair and it's just. So, that's my thought. Thank you, Ms. Letimer. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Board President. Um, a couple of quick points. I I wanted to underscore, you know, Ms. Lett America and I were on this committee and um, uh, participated uh, 
and what I thought was or very, very robust discussions with staff, community members, and board members um, around the policy, the demographic issues, the operational issues, the financial issues. I think it was a pretty thorough vetting, and as we mentioned when, um, uh, who was, what's Katie's last name? Bimson. Bimson, thank you. When Ms. Bimson was here the other day, uh, oh, at the other meeting, it was a very, uh, I think a very productive and well-run uh, effort, and, and I think the uh, recommendations were well vetted. Um, on a couple of points, um, the, we're, we're experiencing secular decline. Um, you know, the, the community member asked, is, you know, is this the result of people leaving the district? Is this the result of, you know, things that uh, are under our control? Almost every school district in California is experiencing decline. Uh, as uh, uh, someone mentioned, Cooper, you mentioned Ms. DeBrienza, Cupertino's closed school, Ravenswood closed half their elementary schools within the last three years. Uh, the, every, every district in California, and when the ESSER funding cliff happens, next year and the year after, you will see massive numbers of schools close all over California. Massive numbers. I mean, the Oakland tried to close eight two years ago. My guess is they'll try to close 40 in a couple of years. San Francisco, the same. Los Angeles, untold number of schools will close. So this is not a Palo Alto situation. This is a California situation. Um, the United States situation, really. Uh, yeah. Some states more than others, yeah. but yeah, California turns out to be, I think, at one end of the spectrum, but yes, yeah. it is a, and driven primarily by um, demographics. The birth rate in California is lower than it has been since the Great Depression, yeah. um, which is a remarkable, uh, remarkable thing, as well as the, the um, which contributes to the lack of growth in uh, the California populations historically enjoyed. Um, the operational issues, which I think are the main driver here, are incredibly real. I mean, the, the discussion, I don't think it, it got mentioned, but I don't think it got mentioned, uh, it got underscored enough. The discussion of the committee primarily focused around, we do these things or we, we embrace combo classes. That's really what it's about. And anybody, I mean, most, most districts and uh, most people, families in Palo Alto Unified have never experienced combo classes may not think it's a big deal or may not even know what it is. Uh, it's a mixed grade class with, you know, you have second and third graders or third and fourth graders in one class, in the same class with one teacher. Um, that Most people who experience it um, find that it, it, it's certainly a situation we can make work and it's effective, but it is not the ideal situation for teachers or families. And I think most families, when they find they're in a combo class, are disappointed with the exception of families at Ohlone, which, have chosen. which has been designed for it and have chosen it. That's a totally different scenario. Um, yeah. So the, one of the main, foci, focus, the main focus of the t discussions was how do we avoid combo classes continuing to expand in our district? And avoid closing schools. And, and well, yeah, we talked about closing schools, and, and, and even when you take that off the table, then you end up with combo classes. So I, I think people have to, you have to really focus on, hey, the combo classes, unless you think combo classes are a good idea and we should have more and more of them, th we're gonna have to figure out a way to stabilize enrollment while exactly as Ms. Brian just said, we wait to see if housing in Palo Alto expands. Let's face it, the, number, the smallest school in Palo Alto among the elementary schools is Barron Park School. If you look at a map, there was a map in the, in the paper uh, last week or the week before, uh, during spring break, I think, uh, that showed where all the proposed housing was. None right there. Um, oh, no, all of it right there. At Barron Park? All of it is in the Barron Park catchment area along the south end of El Camino. Mm. Um, for instance, like the McDonald's and um, that fish restaurant. But a lot at San Antonio and, and... Outer San Antonio, some, but a lot a lot of the current projects are along that stretch of El Camino, which is in yeah. the Barron Park attendance area. So it's going to change things. So, lot. yeah, the idea that... And those are projects, some are permitted, some are uh, under construction or some... Wilton Court had, has actually just recently been built. So there's a lot going on that's gonna change the enrollment picture at a school that frankly would be the most likely to be closed. So I think it would be rash to actually uh, not try to stabilize enrollment while we're trying to figure out what's going to happen with housing in Palo Alto. Um, finally, I, on this issue of uh, private school attendance, I've I probably spent more time looking at, uh, well, I spent a lot of time looking at attendance over the years. And I and many and the 
the persistent, there's the persistent belief that there are a lot of people who go to private schools, and, and there are. There are people in Palo Alto, they, they, they value education, they have resources, so they choose private school, which is fine. Um, the question is whether that number has actually uh, increased. And there are two sources that I know of to look at that, and I've looked at both. One is census data, because the census actually does measure, does ask people whether the children attend private school. And the other is the CDE collects enrollment at private schools, um, which you can't foot to enrollment in a given city, but well, I, I did an analysis that I'll describe in a minute. Um, for the census data, the, the indication is that private school enrollment in Palo Alto is actually a lower percentage than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. A lower percentage, it has gone down. I can't tell you why, the census doesn't look into why, but just as a percentage of children living in Palo Alto households attending schools, the percentage attending private schools is less than it was 10 years ago, and meaningfully less than it was 20 years ago. Um, the, second, the second analysis looks at the enrollment at uh, private schools, and you can get this every year going back to, I think, 1999, and I have that data set. And uh, the way people have used it is you take the schools that are in the immediate catchment area around you. So if you think about the towns, probably basically from Sunnyvale up to Redwood City. Um, I took all the private schools in those areas and look at, looked at the enrollment. It actually, again, has, is, it, it's fluctuated across around a pretty stable mean going back to 1999. There's no indication that the enrollment in those schools has increased in a meaningful way over the last 25 years. So there isn't, I mean, I, I tend to really believe, I, people have their beliefs, people have their perceptions. You try to look at the data and see if it lines up with your perceptions of the, the narratives that get told. And all I can tell you in this case is the only data that I can think to look at from two different independent sources doesn't seem to line up with that narrative. There doesn't seem to be any more people going to private school than there ever were in Palo Alto. In fact, arguably maybe less as a percentage. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there because I do think this, this is a persistent uh, narrative that gets told out there. I used to, when I started in the district, I was always told about the middle schools. It's like, oh, Palo Alto middle schools are terrible. Everybody sends their kids away. Then it turned out, I looked at my old town, Newton, Mass. And it, no, no place could be more independent of Palo Alto than Newton, Mass. Exactly the same enrollment trend in Newton, Mass that you see here where there is a significant drop between elementary school and middle school, and then an increase when kid comes back to high school. And that made me feel pretty comfortable that we weren't talking about something that was idiosyncratic to the middle school management in Palo Alto. This was actually something about affluent parents, and maybe parents in general, because we only, I only happened to look at two affluent towns, um, where they like sending their kids to uh, private middle schools that offer, among other things, gender segregated education. Um, so something to think about, but I, I do think that the, the reality is we have secular uh, enrollment decline um, with imminent possible increase, stabilization and increase. And I think it would be foolish to pull the trigger on things while we're, while we're waiting to see the cards. The cards are being flipped over at the poker table, and while we're waiting for the cards to flip, we shouldn't be cashing in our chips. When we, when we know we may need to uh, be able to have accommodate growth in the very near future. Um, so I'm very supportive of the recommendations. I think this is, these are great. I did have one question that I just wanted to ask Dr. Austin around the third one. Um, could you just clarify, like, what, how does that work and what, is that, what benefit does that bring to the district or the families? Yeah, I think um, in review of our last time around, we didn't state this clear enough. So... Uh, our staff came to me and said, you know, I think we need to clarify this a little bit because we said it verbally, but it wasn't great in writing. This is the part I talked about at our last meeting where you have to pick the priority. There's no other way to say it. So what it means is from this point forward, the people that move in last and the people that, whether they're employees, children that are new to the district, or city employees, if you uh, approve this, will be the last to be placed, and it can be as close as five days to the beginning of school. The benefit is, this is where in the past we would have placed all these students, and then we would have had a few move-ins, and now we're in that, in the past, we would have been in the situation that we hate, where it's three days beforehand and we're creating a combo class and moving things around. 
on this one, now we'll wait, and it depends on the school. You know, if, 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 uh, if we can place some students in places where we know there's plenty of room, there's no reason to have to wait until the last minute. But if we're on the bubble and it's a school that's already pretty full, we're gonna wait in, until the very last minute, or in this case, five days beforehand. So the benefit is huge. It is exactly um, the way that we had to do things in my previous district. Mr. Bahadur Singh and I had talked about this a lot and pulled from some of those old protocols. But this is really the essential piece to being able to control where the students go in ways that don't create problems but instead eliminate problems. And if that's if you need more, tell me if that's not if that's not uh, sufficient. I think that's fine. Is that okay? Okay. Student board reps, did you have questions or comments? Yeah, I had a really quick question on um the second bullet point. So I just, I'm just curious if there's a statistic right now that shows how many students um, whose parents work at PASD are enrolled at PASD. We do have that number. Trent, do you have it at your fingertips? It was 200 and something. It's, that's two, 250, I think. Yeah, so a little over 200 less than three. It's in that Which ballpark. In context, out of 10,000 students, two and a half percent. I had a question as well. I think this was mentioned, but I just wanted extra clarification about the reason why 75% was chosen as like the recommendation for reducing the full-time equivalent percentage as opposed to, I heard 60% or 80% or 50% or anything like that. I know that like each period is 20% um, for high schools, but I just wanted more clarification on that. It had been 80%, right? And we were moving. Well, that's what, uh, yeah, that's what I think. The is committee recommended it uh, because I think it had been mentioned at the prior meeting and maybe earlier at this meeting. Um, there are classified staff, especially at the elementary school, where the way the hours are set up that they, that is the, I don't know if it's the maximum or just the, the it's just the way it works out that they are 75% and it's hard for them to go more. And so the prior rule, I think, had been 80%. And the idea was specifically to move it from 80 to 75 in order to accommodate elementary school uh, cl classified, classified staff. Um, and that was, that was what we heard, the, the new numbers, are, I mean, that wasn't discussed, brought up at the committee, and, and, and I, hadn't, I hadn't heard it before just recently this week. Yeah, I want to I just add to that. And I was sort of going to make this comment a little earlier, too, when Mr. Collins was speaking. You know, we served as board members and we, on the committee, and we, we sort of said, hey, we're open to anything, tell us what you guys want. And so I think there was a, so I sort of went in, honestly, I went into that committee thinking we were gonna land on combo classes because we don't wanna close schools. And the committee was so creative and came up with these ideas that, and the committee was very, very, if, any, if there was sort of unanimity in anything, it was teachers, principals, everybody saying we don't want combo classes. So we were like, okay. Great, fine, we just have to have enough tools to allow staff to make that work. And so, to Mr. the point that was just made about 0.75 was what was presented at the committee and what was talked about, and nobody on that committee, there were, again, teachers, principals, nobody gave another number. And there were a lot of conversations. So I think probably if another number had been given, we would have talked about that, and that would have been recommended. So that's. What I can say is we weren't recommending things. We were listening and yeah. providing some our our information that we had, if we could provide it as board members. Can I just add one more comment on that? Partly in answer to your question. If if another number makes sense, I, what I would suggest is that we approve this as is now and ask staff to vet it, and then if they want to come back with a different proposal, they can do that. It's like you read my mind. <laughs> two um, two yes. bodies, two bodies, one mind. Yes, there, there you go. <laughs> That's how I often think of us, Mr. Collins. Um, you, yeah, sure, of course you can. Ms. Thank Sarah. you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that was really helpful. Um, I wanted to just, um, I think that's great, like bringing it back to staff and seeing if they have any comments on it because it's definitely possible in committees that like maybe things just don't get talked about but are so important, of course. Um, I wanted to ask, like, I know that high schools they're like 
block down is like 20% for each period. What is like the step down or step up for like an elementary school worker? Is it like a little bit different or not in steps? And then also, um, I know we talked about how having more students is definitely more beneficial. We don't have like a magic number or quota for that. So what is also restricting us from bringing the percentage lower if there is a restriction at all? couple things uh, elementary and elementary uh, split assignments are um, first of all sometimes justified Irrelevant. definitely not um, as we look at best practices if we say combination classes can work but they're not our best practice the same is true of split assignments now it doesn't mean that some can't work beautifully it just means as a as a rule it's not something that we're going out and soliciting looking for uh, elementaries are, uh, I believe, often divided by days. So while a, a period at a, at a secondary school is a, is a point to, a day is a point to in, in an elementary split assignment. Does that make sense? So a teacher that works two days a week would have a 40% assignment. And a teacher that works three would have a 60, and sometimes you match those up. There's a whole lot of different configurations that we can work through. In my old district, we had half days were 10%, and so that you could be 90%, and, and it's kind of wonky. I do think if this wasn't clear, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe the 0.75, the idea was kind of to bring more parity to what is done with, it's sort of the equivalent of the 0.8 for teachers is the 0.75 for classified. And so there was some sort of, there wasn't, great parity between the between the, the two sets of staff. And so that was, I think, that was the impetus behind the suggestion and, was to kind of and fix that. And secondary and elementary. Right. Because I think it's secondary they could get to point eight. Exactly. Elementary they couldn't. Right. Does that make sense? Okay, so I have a few comments and then we'll take a motion and my suggestion even before the motion. Oh, do you have another question? I, yeah, I Go, I sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I don't think the second question was specific. Go ahead, repeat it. Um, Oh, why don't we just take, why don't we just lower that number and just take more Yeah, my question was about kids. if there are any, I, I apologize if you already answered it, but I didn't, I didn't feel like clarity on that. So yeah, what are the limits, if there are any, to lowering the FTE percentage lower than 75 or lower in general? So that kind of seems like, you know, Ms. Siegel asked the question first, right? And so I think, um, as Mr. Collins said, it probably makes sense for us to approve, well, take, consider this motion tonight and ask staff to think about different, whether it's a, a 0.6 or a 0.5 or lower than that for any and all staff, what would the ramifications of that be? And to, to decide if you all would recommend it or not. It, maybe you have an estimate as to how many kids that would bring in um, and come back to us with that. You know, we can, you can bring it back to agenda settings so we can figure out what makes sense to do with it. Yeah, we can do two things. I, th I think the short answer to your very good question is uh, we're not prepared to respond to that in a meaningful way tonight, and that'd be a bad way to make a decision. Yeah. And we've done a good job of not doing that, so I'd appreciate that. Uh, next, the, the, you know, the nice part about this is you should not, as a board, feel like any decision tonight is for the history of the district. Yeah. You're gonna revisit this every year. You could revisit this one in a month, but you're gonna revisit it every year. We can probably count on adjustments up, down, unforeseen um, issues that arise. So I just don't want you to feel like you have one shot at this ever. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't want our associations to feel that way either. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. I want to clarify just a quick, yes. Oh, sorry, quick clarifying question. So if we vote on it as is tonight, um, and we direct staff to look into that number, is that is does that happen before it's finalized, or can you just help me better understand the process? No, I think if we approve it, that'll that'll be our policy. But then when staff is ready to come back to us, and if we take it under consideration and change that, then it will change our policy. Okay. You know, I think we would decide that, and it would depend on our timing and. And you're, um, and Ms. Lodomirik and Mr. Collins, what I heard you say, and I just wanna make sure I'm hearing everything correctly with, before I make a vote, is that at the meeting, the, it was stated that we wanna hear what number, and the number that was stated um, was 0.8, and it went to 0.75, and th that was the number that was thrown out? Yes. I mean, that's what I heard 
Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think the, it, the, the number already was 0.8. Yes. And so then there was a Six, suggestion. Okay. Somebody at the committee made a suggestion to okay. lower it to 0.75. Was classified there a suggestion is, for it? Was there a lower number that was suggested? No, it was, no, it would have been on the no other number. No okay. other number that was, was ever talked about. Um, that was my question. Okay. Great. Um, I, I think almost all my things have been said. Uh, the one thing I would just say is, assuming we go ahead and approve this, um, that number three about really making those determinations earlier and then latecomers um, may be assigned to a different school, um, I just think it's really important that we make sure that we communicate to families, even families that aren't with us yet somehow, I don't really know how we do that, um, trying to help them understand. I know, that's pretty good, right? You're, you're gonna stand up in, in town square and you know, with a bullhorn, make sure everyone knows. Um, but if we really just think about trying to communicate with all current families and if we are in touch with any you know, incoming families, um, making sure everyone knows when priority deadline is to register so that we get as, as accurate a count as possible early on. Obviously, it's going to change more. People are going to move in. People aren't going to have gotten the memo. Um, but I think it adds sort of more importance to that priority registration deadline. Um, so if staff can just keep that in mind as you're, I mean, sometimes it's like advertised in the paper, right, when, when registration is. There's all kinds of places it winds up. Um, so I think that would be really important. Are we ready for a motion? I move uh, we approve the item as presented. Second. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Did we answer other questions? <laughs> I cut you off twice. I feel bad. <laughs> okay. Come back at us anytime with any others. Um, okay. Student preferential board vote on this item as presented. Aye. Aye. And colleagues, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Decision made. Thank you all. Whew. Uh, 5C, going on to bond project list. All right, Mr. Holm. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening, board. This is the um, second read of the revised bond project list that we brought forth last time. There's no changes to it. We just... Um, captured the fact that, that we talked about it last time. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Do I have a motion? Move the item as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, it is on the table. Any questions, any comments for Mr. Holm? Great, student preferential board vote. Aye. Aye. Colleagues, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Get to work. <laughs> Get going. Okay, 5D. Two things, um, and I, I told Mr. Brahadar saying I would just handle this one. In reverse order of importance. He takes these things, right? Like, yes. This is the fun stuff, and he's like, I want to take it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many jokes. All right. In reverse order of importance, um, due to some moves that we've made with personnel, uh, even with this well-deserved um, promotion, the district will have a $300,000 savings with another reduction in administration. We were already at 14% down. Uh, this will further reduce. Um, Those are the kinds of promotions I like. Well, hopefully that's the headline tomorrow <laughs> to anyone who's watching. Um, but then more, more importantly, uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, to highlight and, and, and you know, promote a person who's done a fantastic job here. And, and in multiple roles, each time um, working beyond that role so quickly that we had to create something else to fill it up. And I don't know what uh, Dr. Che's uh, ultimate capacity is and what our breaking point is, but we're looking for it. We're, we're, we're trying as hard as we can to find it and, and can't. Um, Dr. Che is, is, is shown herself to be part of the glue that holds the whole team together. Uh, she is part of a, a real movement to, to find people that can play in multiple parts of an organization and she can she can jump into any part and make whoever's working there better 
And we're very excited about not only her contributions in the past, but what she can do in the future. She's the perfect person as we transition. You know, five years ago, I just want to go back real quickly. Five years ago, for those of you that were on the board at that time, uh, which is a smaller number now than it was not long ago, <laughs> um, we talked a lot about operations and just getting the fundamentals right, and that it will always be a commitment, something that we need to continue to do. But we're in a position now where we can start to stretch, but stretch strategically. Uh, one thing I've told our entire team, um, you will be in big trouble if you talk about moonshots. That is not what moon, uh, innovation is about. It's about strategically stretching in the next places that make sense. Just like Fletcher going into sustainability made sense. We didn't have to explain it. It was the next logical piece. We're gonna look for those innovative places that make sense that we can go in together and have a high, high likelihood of success. Uh, so for those reasons, I did meet with uh, our PAMA group, and uh, I can tell you when I told um, our leadership team what, what our plans were, the, uh, the reaction was immediate and strong in, in favor of celebrating Dr. Che and what she brings to our district. So now you have it, and as a reminder, when you're done discussing, this has some pieces that need to be read aloud. Okay. Um, that means I'm actually going to have to open the other version of this. Okay. Give me one moment. Um, I have. Thank you for checking, but I do not have public comment. Um, while I am bringing up the thing I have to read, does anyone have any questions or comments? Just to say congratulations and very well deserved. I think I probably speak for everybody up here, but I'll certainly speak for myself. Very well deserved. We're very happy to be able. I'm very happy to be able to vote to approve this tonight. Anyone else? Well, now I put you on the yeah, spot. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm also very excited. I've been um, very enthused by your work since I started on the board, and it's been really great. Um, and, you know, I think, like Dr. Austin said, it's, it's the glue, but it's also, you know, it accentuates parts of the work that everyone does, which is always great. It's always great to be able to have a team member who does that. So um, really looking forward to seeing you with that new title and responsibility and seeing where else we can go. I just wanted to give a quick congratulations and how fortunate and grateful I am, and I'm, I'm sure we all are, that you are part of our district, that's all. I remember when you joined us and, and the big selling point was, don't worry, she has a grant that's gonna pay for her salary, so she's not costing us anything. <laughs> And my, how far we've come, <laughs> that we actually see the value, even if it cost us something. Um, but I'm really excited. Um, and congratulations. Well, well earned. Um, I am now going to read what I have to read. Uh, the board will consider entering into an employment agreement with Dr. Che. The financial terms of the contract are the following. Compensation. The assistant superintendent of innovation and agile teams will receive an annual base. Damn, I did it again. Sorry. What's, you're clearly not 50 yet, if this is your brightness. <laughs> um, with a, nope, it's OK. With an annual base salary of 227,600. I'm scared to move it a little bit, because you zoomed it, and I can't, it goes off the page. 686,000. Uh, I'm going to say that again, $227,686. This annual salary represents step one of the contracted management salary schedule. Fringe benefits, the assistant superintendent of innovation and agile teams shall receive district paid health, dental, vision, and other fringe benefits in the same manner and subject to the same limitations as other contracted management personnel as these benefits may change from time to time. Financial impact, Dr. Che's change in position will result in an annual increase in compensation of $5,008. Uh, the district will not be replacing Dr. Che's current um, director position. Additionally, the director of academic initiatives position will not be replaced, which will result in a reduction of management compensation of $301,273 in salary and benefits. Thank you for sharing that with me because the mobile is not so helpful. Uh, any comments or questions or do I have a motion? I move that we approve the employment agreement of Dr. Che. 
Second. Student preferential board vote. Aye. Aye. I like how you alternated there. That was nice. Um, colleagues, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. No, I don't. No, okay. Um, okay, on to um, the PAUSD promise, our first discussion item. Well, I'm going to bring up Dr. Che, who better be really, really good now. <laughs> better, better than she was as a director. And <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay, so before, before we turn it over to Dr. Che, I just want to seriously thank her and everybody else who has worked on the uh, PAUSD Promise, something that um, was just a thought a few years ago and now is becoming something routine. Uh, something that we reference, something that we align our efforts and resources with, something that we measure against. It's a really good thing. And we uh, had just sent out a survey to all families asking for their input uh, as well. So this is clearly still just a draft. It will come back with revisions. And our two student board reps helped me to um, check that they were not sent the uh, the survey, so that went out this afternoon. That was an oversight. Uh, that was supposed to happen, just didn't happen. So that went out, and if we need to extend that window a little bit, we'll do that to, to get the uh, student input as well. But tonight, this quick presentation. Uh, we can take questions, feedback, and then we'll bring you back another version at the next meeting. Dr. Che. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, PAUSD follows an iterative process to develop goals in order to maximize student impact. This year's Promise Annual Report was shared with the board in March. And since then, uh, we've been working and reflecting and started developing next year's goals. Getting diverse stakeholder feedback is an important aspect of formulating next year's goals. There are two parts to this input process. The first part is gathering input from the leadership team, which is reflected in the attached version. The second part involves gathering input from teachers, staff, students, and families. The survey for this part was sent out, and the data collected through this process will go through qualitative analysis to develop themes that will contribute to our final version of the promise goals. We're very excited to include, uh, introduce this innovation section as a new priority area, replacing the healthy attendance. Under innovation, we're trying to support diverse learners and motivate students intrinsically to drive their learning. This includes nurturing creativity and innovation to inspire students to use an inquiry mindset leveraging technology. Some of the key strategies under this section include expansion of dual enrollment, improving the effectiveness of instruction and learning through standard-based grading. Being in the heart of Silicon Valley, we also want to expand our industry partnerships and provide more real world opportunities for our students, which can help further um, improve their future employability. We will continue to build our next year's promise through the interactive input process as they will evolve after incorporating the additional feedback from diverse stakeholder groups. And then we'll be bringing back um, the final version at a future meeting. Thank you. Uh, we happen to have two comments, which I'm acknowledging right here. Um, Edith Cohen and Lars Johnson, who I believe are both here in person. Yep. Edith, come on up. Two minutes each. Um, yes. Yeah, so hi, everyone. So uh, one of the important things a school uh, needs to do is uh, work on academic achievement. And we all know we have a big problem that 70% of uh, the disadvantaged students are not meeting grade level standards. Um, so, uh, so, there are, uh, so this is uh, something that needs to be fixed, and it needs to be fixed at the early grades. So there are the early literacy uh, initiative, and uh, there are indicators. There are three indicators to measure progress. The first two are completely statistically flawed. They are random coin tosses. This had been pointed out before. They are still there. It's basically two small groups, and you're measure, measuring it cross-sectionally. It's completely meaningless. Okay, this three, four percent on these size groups, it's meaningless, the way it's done. Uh, so congratulations for using iReady. Uh, that's a huge improvement. Um, because that's uh, an actual good measure. 
but, but uh, the third measure shouldn't bundle all fifth grades together because it's important to see what's going on, where we're losing students in each grade, and it should be used longitudinally instead of cross-sectionally. Meaning, if you really want to look at a small group and see improvement, you have to look at how much growth each student, a particular student achieves in each year. You want the promise to have a year of growth to every student. That's the only way you can look at what you're doing to tiny groups like black students that we have maybe 10 a year, okay? So you, you can't look at it the way you're looking at it, that you're just looking at the whole group and at a different group kind of, uh, a, a little bit different group uh, year to year. Uh, you need to do it longitudinally, okay? Uh, so now uh, you're looking at uh, literacy, but you're completely ignoring math. In math, the situation is even worse. Why are you ignoring math? Um, you have, uh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Um, Mr. Johnson. Board of PAUSD.org. Good evening. Um, thank you, PAUSD, for making a promise. And thank you also for working very hard to keep the promise. One such example is the PAUSD leadership unanimously deciding to stop factoring grades from off-campus math classes into the PAUSD GPA. That the district was promptly sued means you must be doing something right and trying to reduce academic one-upmanship. Even students interviewed in the Campanile got straight to the point that these off-campus math classes are not taken out of the love of math, but out of the desire to pump up the GPA. Uh, said student Wong in that Campanile interview, I know a lot of people at our school are using off-campus classes to inflate their GPA. Um, said uh, admitted student Marabushi, the whole point of taking off course uh, campus classes is that you want it to be counted towards your GPA because that does help you with colleges. And if there is no more point in taking off campus math courses, uh, a US News and World Report survey of college counselors has valuable advice for those affected, as summarized by Rachel Walsoff. The most important component of college application include the essay, extracurricular activities, and leadership focus that help you become three-dimensional. You become more than academic statistics of GPA and test scores. Your personality and character should shine through. I would like to add some personal advice. Based on my experience from interviewing and hiring hundreds of candidates while living the startup, high-tech, engineering, and business dream in the Valley for 25 years, your personality and character must shine through. It is not optional. Being well-rounded, able to communicate effectively, and think on your feet will always win over particularly good, being particularly good at just one thing. So um, one more word to the math plaintiffs. If you would focus your love and devotion to create the opportunities that allow your students to grow in these other dimensions, it will be priceless for their career success. It also frees up precious district resources Thank needed you, to make Mr. sure Johnson. that the promise will be fulfilled. Thank you. You can send the rest of your comments to board at PAUSD.org. Um, okay, uh, that's all the comments, I believe. Yes. Okay, colleagues, any comments or questions about the promise draft? Go ahead. First, I want to thank every staff member who worked on the promise. Um, and I was very excited to see the part about innovation um, very great, many, many bullet points. And my only suggestion would be to perhaps examine the bullet points to ensure greater clarity for our stakeholders. There was quite a lot of maybe like jargon, lots of educational terms. Hmm. So maybe adding some definitions to improve clarity for our constituents. That's it? Okay. Nothing. Anything? Anything. Okay, jump into me then. Um, just a few. One, thank you to everyone working on it. Um, I think you really um, sort of hit the nail on the head when you said we, this was just an idea <laughs> um, a few years ago and now it's really our guiding document. Um, and I was reminded of this when I became board president. We used to, the last time I was board president, um, one of the first things we do is have a um, board study session about our goals and priorities for the next year. And I have to tell you, the first two or three years that I was on the board, it was like popcorn. Like every year, there were new priorities and new goals. We were all over the place. There were too many of them. Um, and the way that this is now designed, that really any initiative we do, anything we do, connects to one of these priorities. 
and it is a document that is on our website that people can see, like you said, as long as it's accessible to all people in the language that, that we use, um, people can really understand what our priorities are and, and what our key performance indicators are. And really everything that we're doing is working towards that. Um, and I think that that's, um, it, it, it sort of simplifies, simplifies, in some ways it complicates your work because you're getting a lot more done. Um, but I think it really simplifies um, the, sort of the chaos that a school district can be. Um, and we're really laser focused on just a handful of goals. So thank you for that. Um, I was also excited to see the innovation piece agree. We're not going for moonshots. We're trying to look at what is it that we, what are ways that we could be innovating, that we could be better serving um, more students, all students, um, and in a changing economy, in a changing world. Um, what, what should those opportunities look like at all levels of our school? Um, I really appreciated seeing the gun safety. Thank you in our, in our safety, wellness, and um, I can't remember what the third point was. Um, but I would love to continue that conversation in hammering out really what those performance indicators would be when it comes to gun violence prevention and safety um, and how we might partner with PTAC to do some parent education and what that might look like for us with student education. Um, and also wanted to check in, I believe that moving through um, Sacramento right now is a bill that would require um, student education on fentanyl risks. And so I assume that, that that would be where it would go as well, right, in the safety and wellness and health. Okay, um, fantastic. And I think that's it for me. And so I look forward to seeing the feedback from the survey you put out um, and what other updates occur. Students. Um, I don't have like anything particular to comment on uh, the five key pieces, but I just want to say that literally every single room I've gone into this year has like the PhD promises written on the whiteboards. And I know um, when I went to Mr. Don, uh, Mr. Don Austin's um, um, whiteboard, it's always like crossed out every time, like there's goals and it's crossed out every time I go in. and. I think it just goes to show like, you know, these promises do actually mean something and I, and I do believe in the board to complete these items next year too. Okay, great. Uh, moving on to our next item. We have got um, authorization to bid me uh, Measure Z summer projects. All right, Mr. Holm. So uh, with the approval minutes ago of our change, we're already starting going on that. Um, so this authorization is for several projects we've got uh, in the queue that we will be doing this summer. A lot of them are in the sort of um, plan maintenance type of realm of, of ongoing upkeep for projects and, and making sure our campuses stay in, in good condition. Great. Um, this is only up for discussion tonight. Can I just ask? Yes. Um, I mean, it's mid-April and these are bid for summer, do you, would it be beneficial to approve these at this meeting? Um, we're prepared either way, if you want to prepare them. I mean, for I'm them. asking, yeah, so, yeah. so it wouldn't be beneficial? We we plan on the two meetings, so we're, we're good if we want to wait, yeah. We've, we've got things lined up that basically the next day you approve it at the next meeting, everything hits. Okay. Okay, great, any questions, comments, concerns? Great, no? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, so information items. We have a few public comments um, for 8A, Healthy Attendance, 8E, Ad Hoc Committee, and 8G, Public Records Act Update. Does anyone have any, any board members have anything else they wanna talk about? Great, okay. Uh, ad Hoc Committee Updates, 8E. Okay, yep. Let's start with uh, one comment from um, Stephen Davis on Healthy Attendance. Uh, it's unfortunate that this uh, topic isn't being presented. Um, the uh, performance of students with disabilities uh, kind of collapsed uh, in terms of healthy attendance. Uh, the number of students, uh, I think, went from something like 11 or 12 percent to 24 percent in terms of chronically absent. And uh, I think that deserves more than just a non-statement uh, in a non-information item. Um, looking at the presentation that was provided, you need to dig deeper 
Was this an age cohort issue? Was it at different schools or across the board? Um, in my old school district, I took a look at the, uh, personally took a look at the suspension data and we had half of the elementary school uh, suspensions at one school. So it wasn't a student problem, it was a staff problem. Uh, and I will say I found no indication of any deeper analysis into this, just the we'll do the usual, the usual way. Um, this may be the symptom of some other problems. Uh, we have not had a proper presentation on the state of the students with disabilities in this district this year. Uh, we have only had the um, uh, colorful discussion of the reorg of the um, restructuring of the uh, mod severe students. Uh, but if you actually look across the board, uh, the data is getting worse. The gap is growing between our students with disabilities and their general ed peers. Uh, and that's across the board. We are overdue for a systematic review and serious review of the Students with Disabilities program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, can I make a comment on it? Sure. Um, I did have the benefit of meeting with Mr. Spiritu um, earlier today to go over that report, in, including the uh, portion on special education, which did show a uh, alarming uh, trend, which was surprising given that there had been improvement in some of the other categories, but a very significant, I mean, more than doubling of chronic absenteeism for special education students. And he was already, you know, well aware of it and um, was actually in the process of invest, they were surprised by it too. There was nothing in the underlying activity or reporting that had suggested that there was a change in the actual attendance experience, but there was clearly a change in the numbers. So I, Dr. Ross, I believe he is gonna come back to you and um, suggest that he may be able to come back with a additional, some additional information at some point later in the year, um, maybe particularly after all the, you know, or there's a partial year report, maybe waiting until after the 180th day and um, being able to give us some insight on what's happening in that area. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Uh, okay, Devin Ardeshna, I'll resume on the ad hoc committee updates. We have two minutes. Um, hi, um, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, so I wanna comment on the dual enrollment committee. Um, I wanna be clear, it's fantastic that PAUSD is looking at ways to expand dual enrollment, um, particularly in the context of CCAP courses, which target college readiness for underrepresented groups. Um, however, some folks seem to believe that CCAP courses are the primary type of dual enrollment, and I think that may be a bit misguided. Um, we only have to look back to 2015 for some examples, um, which is before the CCAP legislation was even introduced. And so obviously there was multivariable calculus for students wanting to pursue advanced math, but Pally also offered an on-campus nanotechnology class, and that was taught by a Foothill instructor. So there were no advanced prerequisites, which meant that anyone could enroll after finishing chemistry. Um, I was fortunate to take this class with Foothill faculty member Bob Cormia, and Mr. Cormia had a passion for nanoscience and for sustainability, and both of which he passed on to his students. Um, he even organized field trips to Foothill and Stanford, where researchers taught us how to use atomic force microscopes, and they uh, showed us around state-of-the-art nanofabrication facilities. So Multivar and Nanotech are just two examples of potential non-CCAP dual enrollment offerings, and I'm glad that I got to take both at Pali. Um, clearly, different types of dual enrollment courses all have their own benefits. So right now, I hope staff can recognize this fact when exploring how to offer multivariable calculus to students. Thank you. Thank you. And the last public comment, Stephen Davis on the Public Records Act update. Uh, there have only been a modest number of public records request, it looks like, for the spring. And I think I may have been responsible for one or two of them. Um, what was uncomfortable, I will say, about me for, the, for this, and I, the reason I'm commenting on it, is uh, a staff member uh, pushed back on one of my requests and said, this is going to be a heck of a lot of work for us. We're going to have to get IT involved and people and stuff. Uh, and it was both 
puzzling and troubling. I thought it was a very reasonable request. Uh, the reason I asked was about was the 504 data for the district actually doesn't make any sense as reported. Um, almost everyone reports separately. They differentiate 504 students from IDEA students, and I think that's what didn't happen here. Otherwise, we have like 50% more 504 students than any other state in the country. So it's weird, and which is why I asked. Um, but the, uh, the pushback was what really bugged me um, because uh, I know a little bit about databases and SQL and ad hoc queries, and this should have been five minutes for anyone who knew what they were doing. It was not a major effort for anyone. Um, the re public, ask, public asks for records for good reason. Uh, I asked for a fair reason, and uh, I didn't like the culture and attitude that was involved. And I think it was really inappropriate, uh, and uh, I hope that there may be, that's not what's limiting the number of real requests from the citizens for real information. Thank you. Say I was wise enough to put it off. I forgot to put it back on. Uh, thank you. Uh, colleagues, are there any other comments on our, any of our info items? Okay. Uh, board operations? I will just share um, a few things quickly. Um, I attended a Santa Clara County School Board Association meeting last week led by Marianne Duan, our county superintendent. And it was really interesting, and I encourage um, members of the community um, to read this report titled A Call to Action, Climate Resilient California Schools Safeguarding Children's Health and Opportunity to Learn in TK through 12. It was written under the leadership of Stanford Center for Innovation and Global Health, Action Lab for Planetary Health, University of California, Berkeley, um, with a diverse group of stakeholders and experts. And in short, it presented a transformative vision for California schools that are climate resilient and sustainable and let out a path, um, laid out a path to realize the vision. It was inspiring and I feel fortunate to be in a district um, that is leading the way with Fletcher's new sustainability for all program, so it's very exciting. Um, also, I was invited to attend a Nixon PTA meeting as Nixon is one of my liaison schools and I wanna thank the president, Colleen Preninger, for inviting me. And I want to acknowledge and thank all of our PTAs and our PTAC for their time and dedication to improving the education, health, and well-being of all children and youth. And I want to give a shout out to our president of our Palo Alto Council of PTAs, our PTAC, Carrie Wagner, for her work and her time. Um, and lastly, um, especially because he's still here, I personally want to thank Eric Holm for the incredible work he and his team are doing. And I want to thank you for answering all of my questions during each and every um, transportation committee meeting. I am new to this, and I am so grateful for your support, for your time, for your entire team, and all that you are doing. That is all. Okay. Uh, okay. I feel like there's a lot of events happening. I think in the next couple of board meetings, we're going to be like, I went to this concert, I went to this play, I went to, um, they're escaping me right now because the um, the builder that I want to recognize tonight is Dr. Guillermo Lopez, who, who while doing the hard work we have him doing here and, you know, raising his kids that are here and really still probably settling into his new community that he's only been here for a little bit, uh, managed to finish his dissertation and defend it. Um, last week. So congratulations, Dr. Lopez. We are very grateful to have you here. Not a small feat. Um, very, very impressive. Uh, that's it for me. Really quick, I wanted to say, um, I was uh, lucky enough and grateful to be asked for the second year in a row to give a, a kind of kickoff, very brief speech at Pali um, service day today, and I just want to say thank you to all the students who showed up for that event, and a big thank you to to YCS. They are truly um, such a wonderful partner of our district, and we're very grateful to, we're very lucky to have them, and I was very grateful to be there today. Okay, meeting is adjourned.